This week on Artsbeat, a look at the evolution of roles for transgendered actors. Ben Cesario on demand for music by Amy Winehouse in the days after her death, and TV Loves New York, how the city is luring productions to local studios. In the new film Gun Hill Road, Isai Morales plays a man named Enrique, who comes home to the Bronx after being released from jail to find that his son, Michael, played by the newcomer Harmony Santana, is transgender and goes by the name of Vanessa. Live in the middle with a peace of mind. Make like a mirror and turn me lovely. Mm -hmm. Face to face and say you love me. What sets Miss Santana apart is that she is a transgender person playing a transgender role on screen. That hasn't always been the case. Cross-dressing and drag have long histories in film. Perhaps the most famous is when Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon dressed as women, not so convincing women, in the classic comedy, Some Like It Hot. What's the matter now? How do they walk in these things, huh? How do they keep their balance? But playing a man in drag is not the same as playing an actual transgender character whose very identity is that of the opposite sex and who may live full time as a man or a woman. You're just gonna stand there? You're not gonna say anything. Yo, what you want me to say, yo? Ain't like they lying. Transgender characters have appeared in several mainstream films over the past few decades, and Oscar nominations have gone to several actors who have played those roles. Garp! Including John Lithgow in Garp. The World According to Garp, Felicity Huffman in Transamerica, and Hilary Swank, who actually won an Oscar wow. for her role in Boys Don't Cry. Tina Chick seems pretty messed up. But none of these actors are themselves transgender. The heyday for transgender actors playing transgender characters may have been in the late 60s and early 70s, when the director Paul Morrissey and the artist Andy Warhol introduced America to the transgender performers Holly Woodlawn, Jackie Don't Curtis, and Candy Darling. When is a tampon right for you? <laughs> Today, the pool of openly transgender actors is very small, a result, perhaps, of the continued marginalization of the transgender community, which, while allied with the gay and lesbian community, faces its own set of struggles. Don't you understand this can happen? You're supposed to have my back, Angie. Kick it. Harmony Santana and other transgender actors are hoping to take their place on the big screen, telling real transgender stories through authentically transgender eyes. They tried to make me go to rehab, I said no, no, no. Amy Winehouse died on Saturday, and in a pattern that we've seen before, her record sales exploded. She returned to the top 10. She sold more albums last week than she did in the entire beginning of 2011. They tried to make me go to rehab, I won't go, go, go. We saw this with Michael Jackson two years ago. And with Michael Jackson, uh, there was a huge rush of sales. There was also a movie that came out. There's the man. There's Michael. Woo! The man is here. An enormous amount of memorabilia. And that's because Michael Jackson, of course, had a four decade career with numerous number one hits. Amy Winehouse only had two records. Her last album was recorded five years ago, and she had been recording for a new record, but that's not ready to go yet. What her fans are wondering now, and also people in the music business, is how much music is there left? How much is there in the vaults to release by Amy Winehouse now? And is this situation gonna be like Tupac Shakur, where after he died, there was album after album after album released of seemingly every sound that he uttered in front of a microphone before he died. You could look at this situation cynically, that there's a big corporation profiting from the death of an artist. You could also look at it from the perspective of the fans. She was a hugely admired singer around the world who only had two records out. And now there are lots of people who legitimately want to know what was she capable of? What more did she have to say? You can see what looks like a real New York City skyline is really photo magic. And you're going to see as we walk through this door, how Hollywood and New York come together. Yeah. I mean, we have 6th Avenue here in Queens, and uh, now you'll see how it differs a little bit in real life. 
New York is experiencing a surge in television productions as Hollywood comes to Queens in search of uh, tax incentives, uh, A-list talent from Broadway, as well as the architectural diversity of New York City. Right now, in total, we have close to 450,000 square feet of studio and support space. Presently, we're the largest facility uh, in New York City or in the Northeast United States. HBO was kind of our first major TV client. First show didn't make it, but the next two shows, they did okay. One was called Sex and the City, the other was called The Sopranos. Sometimes a production just needs to shoot in New York, and they want to be here because the talent wants to be here, because the script demands it, because the shooting demands it. And once they realized that there were world-class facilities here, it made sense to do a full production here versus shooting part in LA and then coming here to do location shooting. The Hollywood influx is not new. In fact, there is a very rich uh, Hollywood uh, tradition going back to the 1920s where Paramount Studios set up the first big studio in Queens during the silent film era. And back then you had the Marx Brothers, you had Valent Rudolph Valentino. Um, the Marx Brothers were making animal crackers during the day and at night they would appear on Broadway. When the business picked up and moved to Hollywood, they followed and for a long time this building was used as the Army Pictorial Center. All of the films and propaganda and training materials from 1940 through 1970 were done here. LA is still the center for TV production and LA was built for the entertainment industry in a way that Detroit was built for cars. However, having said that, New York has several things that LA lacks and the most important draw at the moment is economic. The tax incentives in New York are 30% compared to 20% uh, for LA. But beyond that, the frenetic energy of New York and the architectural diversity is a huge attraction. We have great crews, we have great writers, we have great directors, people that want to live and work here. I think as long as New York is a healthy, vibrant city, people want to be in New York. We've been here a long time and we hope to be here for another 90 years. That's the goal.